Edify means to enlighten, encourage, and uplift individuals intellectually, morally, and spiritually. And that's exactly what our Edify podcast guests do as they share practical wisdom on living our faith in public. I'm Scott Landry. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest is Matthew Leonard, who's a Catholic convert, author, speaker, filmmaker, and founder of The Science of Sainthood, an online platform where Matt helps Catholics radically transform their spiritual lives and grow toward sainthood. Matt and his, Matthew and his wife have six children and live now in Ohio. Matthew also has a popular podcast titled The Art of Catholic, and it's quite possible you've heard him on EWTN, Relevant Radio, CBS, The Covenant Network, Sirius XM, or others. He speaks often at parishes across the country and has written a 2016 book called Louder Than Words, The Art of Living as a Catholic. And he just recorded the Edify episode, The One Thing You Need. Welcome, Matthew. It's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. So I'm sure the name, The Science of Sainthood, piques our listeners' interest. Many Catholics have heard in some fashion that the goal of life is to become a saint, to become everything God created us to be. But so many Catholics, and I can say in my life, I haven't always intentionally pursued with one of the the most important uh, focus uh, areas of focus in my life to pursue sainthood. I'd like to think that I do now, but I haven't always done it. What are the major reasons why Catholics today just don't focus on trying to become a saint? I think a lot of it has to do with the way that we were formed growing up or lack of formation. But I think sometimes we think of saints as kind of this cliche like they're people on the holy cards or they're people on the walls or whatever, but those are like aliens, you know, who happen to live among us. But that's not really me. You know, I'm living in the day to day world. And so we just don't think of ourselves in those terms. But Christ himself says in Matthew 5, 48, to be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect. That's the goal of the spiritual life. And I think we don't realize that really that perfection what we're supposed to go through in this life is sainthood. That's really what it boils down. There's the, the only people in heaven, Scott, are saints. That's it. And so if we're going to get to heaven, we have to become saints as well. And saints take all different forms. Um, one of the things that I thought about when I was a young kid was, oh, to be a saint, that just means you're praying all the time or you're just doing <laughs> pious activities. But I've learned as I've grown in spiritual maturity that it's God gives us all different types of gifts. He gives us certainly a different mix of gifts than most of us. So what about being a saint is individualistic? What about being a saint is something that we all should be pursuing in, in similar ways? Well, it's interesting because I think the saints would say, and, and they've shown us in their spiritual writings, that all of us follow the same kind of spiritual trajectory as we go through this life. So we're all going to go through the different stages of the spiritual life. They're generally the same for everybody. But God is our perfect father and we're his children. And so he deals with each one of us individually based on our relationship with him. So my spiritual temperament may be very different than yours. And so God's going to deal with me just like I deal with my six kids differently because they're different. So too does God deal with us differently, even though we're all headed to the same place. So he's going to use my strengths and weaknesses. He's going to help me grow in virtue, maybe work on the weaknesses that I have so that I can achieve a kind of a balance as I'm moving through the spiritual life so I can be joined to him. So I'm sure when people heard the name of your online platform, The Science of Sainthood, they're, they might be thinking to themselves, I never really thought of sainthood as a science. Certainly the name implies that you believe sainthood certainly has science to it, maybe even more science than art. Is that true? And what makes sainthood a science? You know, this is something I didn't realize when I first became Catholic 20 four years ago now, I was so overwhelmed with everything that I encountered in the church that I kind of uh, lost track of any methodological approach to my faith. I was just so overwhelmed with the beauty and the truth and the goodness of what it is I encountered. But as time went by, I realized I had all these resources, but I hadn't put them in, in some kind of an order. And I was reading in Augustine one day where he talked about this science of sainthood. So I didn't come up with that name myself. I've totally ripped it off from St. Augustine. And St. Catherine of Siena talks about the same thing as well. She calls it the holy science of love. 
And the way that I had kind of approached the faith up to that point in time was I have the sacraments, I have prayer, I have all these different things. And I'm just kind of treading water, trying to stay afloat and hoping to be in a state of grace when Jesus came back or I died, whichever one came first. What I hadn't realized, and it took me a while to realize, was that I needed to go below the surface and explore the incredible resources that the church had in a systematic process. Because just like we grow up in the natural life, so we move from infancy into adolescence and then adulthood, the same exact thing happens in the supernatural life. We grow up in the faith and there's a process by which we mature in the faith. And unless we know what that process is and we're making our way down it or through it, then we're just gonna stay spiritual infants, which at the end of the day doesn't benefit anybody. Some of us are very structured. Some of us are very unstructured. I happen to be a structured person, and I really started to progress in my knowledge of the faith when it was presented systematically with a structure so that I could see, oh, this is why that comes, because it ties to these three things and things like that. And the other thing I think about science is personally is how much my faith has grown as I've adopted different habits each day that have helped me at that season of my life. So how much is the habit formation, learning from the habits of saints that have come before us, learning from spiritual mentors who were with us in this era of our lives, how much is habit formation part of this science of sainthood? Well, it's huge. I mean, just like you grow in perfection by practicing something, you know, whether it's football, basketball, golf for me, you know, uh, you get better at it. And it's the same thing in our, our spiritual lives. We have to be intentional about this. And so when you look at the lives of the saints and even people today that you know are growing in holiness, the reason why most of the time these people are growing is because they have a structured set to their day that they go through on a daily basis. So for example, uh, for me, uh, with six kids, the only time I can pray is really early in the morning. So I get up before everybody else and uh, I, I spend my hour in meditative prayer and I pray my rosary and all the rest. And then I kick my day off with my kids and I'm able to get the daily mass. Well, when noon comes around, I will check back in with God, so to speak, with the Angelus. It's a super fast prayer. At three o'clock, Divine Mercy Chaplet, 10 minutes, you know, and then evening prayer and, and, and an examination of conscience uh, in the evening. But these are just kind of small things. They don't overwhelm your day. But what they do is they keep you in alignment with God because you know, we kind of think of we do these spiritual practices and then, you know, I have the rest of my life. There is never a moment in time when we are out of communion with God or we are supposed to be out of communion with God. This is why St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray constantly. And he doesn't mean we're muttering things to ourselves as we're wandering all, of, all the you know, time so people think we're crazy or something. What he means is we're supposed to be living in a state of prayer that envelops every aspect of our lives because everything in our lives is meant to be ordered to communion with God. So a structure and a routine sets that up and gives us a, an avenue for success so that we can have an ordered process to our day to stay in communion with God. One of the things I've appreciated in learning more about you and the resources you offer to Catholics is it's not all science with you. You mentioned a little bit earlier that it was the art, the beauty of the church that helped draw you to want to become Catholic. The uh, title of your blog is The Art of Catholic, and the subtitle of your book that came out a few years ago, Louder Than Words, is The Art of Living as a Catholic. So in your own life, what about living a good Catholic life, the best uh, you can live it, following God's inspirations to you, is more art than science? You know, one of the you're you're right on it. I mean, I love the beauty of the church, and we all want our lives to be beautiful, or we should want our lives because God is truth, beauty, and goodness. And a lot of times we forget about that. And it's easy to get kind of too much into the utilitarian. I have my set structure, I do this, that, and the other. Life is an adventure, right? And the life that is lived in God is a beautiful adventure. That doesn't mean we're not going to encounter challenges and sufferings and all the rest of those things. We are. 
But that came because of sin, not because of God. What God does when he comes into our life, and this is where the art plays out, is that he takes those things in our lives that, that are challenges and he reorients them to our sanctification and to our salvation. And so all the different things of the day that kind of come together to, to paint this mosaic or to put together this mosaic of, of our daily life are all ordered to God. And so there's an art to how it is that I'm going to deal with the things of this life as they are presented to me on a moment by moment basis so that I can move forward in my relationship with him. This is one of the greatest things. It's not that the Catholic life is just a hard and fast set of rules that we have to obey. And, you know, and if we don't, we're going to go to hell. And you know, that is not what this is about. We are made for something that is so beautiful, we can't even comprehend it. And what the church gives us, especially in its spiritual patrimony, is the way to deal with the things that come to us on a daily basis and live this life beautifully, ordered to the tragic beauty of Jesus Christ and the cross and his resurrection and ascension. So many people are misinformed today about what the Catholic Church truly is about. They think about the church as just a list of lots of rules, a lot yeah. of thou shalts and a lot of thou shalt nots. And they miss that it's more about relationship than rules. And that relationship is with God. And one of the best ways we can access that relationship is through prayer. You wrote a book a few years ago, Prayer Works, Getting a Grip on Catholic Spirituality. Unfortunately, a lot of Catholics, a lot of the world today don't pray. They're not in that relationship that God wants for us, that he offers to each of us. What are some of the key reasons why Catholics in particular struggle to have that relationship with God in prayer? You know, one of the reasons why, Scott, I think is because um, I think that sometimes we fall into the habit of thinking about a personal relationship with God as kind of a Protestant thing. Like that's what they talk about. Every one of us is supposed to have a personal relationship with God. In fact, it's what we are made for. And if, if, if you think about it this way, if we're made for union with God and we're headed toward a specific place, which is union for all eternity with God, we have to start that union now because we don't live two lives, one now and one later. Prayer is what establishes that relationship with God now. In fact, the catechism says that it, re, it helps us to reacquire our likeness to God that Adam lost back in the garden. So it has to be a fundamental aspect of our day. Uh, you know, we, we love to ask God for things, right? But we don't have, a, would you ask a stranger for something? You know, hey, help, help me clean my garage or help me get a raise at work. If you didn't know them, no, you'd be like, no way, I'm not going to do that. I, I don't even know that guy. And yet this is exactly what it is that we do with God. So instead of just asking him for things, just like any real friend, we want to enter into a real intimate relationship with him. That's what prayer does. But I think one of the reasons, another reason why Catholics don't do this enough is because they don't really understand how to pray. In fact, the catechism says having the will to do it isn't enough, that there is a, a method to how it is we have to engage in God. And getting pr Catholics to pray, particularly meditative prayer, that to me, if more Catholics had a life of meditative prayer, everything would change. I mean, we see problems inside and outside of the church. If we really had an intimacy with the Lord in our own personal lives through meditative prayer, that would spill out over the top of us to other people and would transform us and the people around us in such a way, well, in a way that we could never do on our own, right? And so we don't practice this enough, but it's something that saints say we're supposed to do every day. In fact, St. Alphonsus Liguori, who never minces words, he was paraphrasing St. Teresa of Avila one time, and he said, if you don't have a regular life of meditative prayer, meaning daily, you don't need demons to carry you to hell. You carry yourself there in your own hands. And so we have to be doing this because we can't say we're Catholics. We can't say we're Christians unless we have a real intimacy with God. And that happens through prayer. And one of my favorite parts of the scriptures is when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray after yeah. observing that he went away in prayer. And he taught them the Our Father. Um, but the word father, some people might call their biological or adopted father, father, but that always seems formal to me. I call my own father, dad. 
But when I was young, I called him daddy. There was this sense of trust in that. And the word Abba that Jesus used means daddy. It's not this distant father. It's not this omnipotent, all-powerful God up in heaven that we might be intimidated to even begin a conversation with. Jesus taught his disciples to pray daddy and then enter the rest of the words of the Our Father. So there is that intimacy that's that's needed. So for those who haven't uh, already watched your video, The One Thing You Need, where you describe um, elements of meditative prayer, how does meditative prayer differ from other types of conversation? and prayers Catholics learn? Well, there are three basic modes of prayer that are universal for all Catholics, vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. We all know vocal prayer. Contemplative prayer is something that God does to us. We don't make it happen. He does it. Meditative prayer is different because the onus is on us. And typically, uh, we're, we need to use something to get us into meditative prayer. So you use a book or art or nature or something like that. And so you take your Magnificat or your bravery, you're like doing Liturgy of the Hours or Sacred Scripture or something like that, and you just begin to read through it. And it's, this is your input into the conversation with God. And the Lord begins to speak to you with what it is you're reading, and you engage Him in conversation. And so it's this kind of give and take. It's all interior. It's a quiet prayer. But God speaks to us. And the point of it isn't just a conversation. The point of it is to transform our lives because we're trying to grow in relationship with Him. So just like, you know, you, you kind of take on the characteristics of people with whom you hang out. You know, if you hang out with your bowling buddies, you might develop a few bad words, right? We hang out with Jesus Christ and rub shoulders with him, so to speak, in meditative prayer and conversing with him quietly. He begins to rub off on us. And really what's happening is his divine life is growing inside of us. It's coming more to the fore. And so that's what meditative prayer does. You know, there's enough grace in one consecrated host to save the entire world. The only thing stopping it is us. And meditative prayer in particular is what gets us out of the way so that that grace can have its maximum impact upon our lives. That is the number one thing that Catholics have got to grasp a hold of and start to do on a regular basis if they wanna grow in the faith. There may be many people listening to this podcast right now that says, I wish somebody had taught me that two years ago, two decades ago, um, or when I was very young. Um, it's a sad fact in the church today that many adult Catholics either didn't grow up in a household where there was good formation from parents or grandparents to them, or didn't have the blessing of a great Catholic school to go to. So a lot of our Catholic faith doesn't make sense. The way to pray, they've never had a mentor who has taken them through step by step at their own pace. And that lack of Catholic formation is, is a challenge that you're trying to address on your online platform, the science of sainthood, um, where you provide all different types of formation, including how to get started with prayer and then how to advance in prayer. So in, in building this platform, what have been your more popular courses and resources that you've been offering uh, to adult Catholics the last several years? I, I think the I, I have programs on St. Teresa of, of Avila's nine grades of prayer and and the virtues and vices and trustful surrender to divine providence and all kinds of various courses. I think the thing that attracts people to this is a everybody knows we have a spiritual itch that needs to be scratched. Uh, and, and this kind of scratches that and kind of it does because it's the teaching of the church, right? It's not because of me. But the beauty of this is it's a systematic treatment of it. So it's not this, that, and the other kind of in a hodgepodge. It is a step-by-step -step process oriented, but, but beautiful. I try to make it as beautiful as possible because beauty is one of the attributes of God. Uh, it's a movement through the spiritual life in the same way that we're supposed to go through it. So all the courses, and there are 20 plus inside the science of sainthood right now, all of them move through it in a particular order. And you can do things, you know, a set course, take it out of context if you want and do it on its own, like on the seven deadly sins or something like that. But there is a process by which we go through it. And this is what I think attracts people because you don't have to figure out what's supposed to come. The saints have already laid this out for us. Uh, I, I've gone through 
I don't know how many gigantic tomes of spiritual theology, which I just can't get enough of. It's like candy to me. And I've kind of called it all down to these 12 or 13 minute long videos that just kind of set you up to walk you step by step for regular Catholics. I mean, this isn't, you know, pie in the sky academic stuff. This is what every one of us is made for. And really, at the end of the day, it's the one thing necessary. In fact, that's what Jesus says in Luke 10. There is one thing necessary. It's not this, that, or the other. It's my relationship with you. And so we need to develop that relationship. And, and just like other relationships, you've got to spend the time in order to grow and get to know who God is because you can't fall in love with somebody you don't know. And that's what the science of sainthood does. It unpacks for us in a systematic way who God is, and how we relate to him and what that looks like in our daily lives. One of the things that I've grown to appreciate as I've gotten older is the stuff that I see myself um, that I wasn't naturally good at, perhaps, but that I became good at in work or in trying to be a good coach of my kids' soccer teams or trying to be as good of a dad as I can is uh, the blessing of good coaches or mentors, people that I can learn from. And it's really become a metaphor for how I want to spend the rest of my life, picking a few metaphors in each season. You know, I, we, as we're recording this, uh, just uh, ended Lent uh, last week, and I wanted to pick different mentors for Lent. And what does that mean for me? Different people typically online, not in person, where I'm like, I'm going to go deep with this person. And in some cases, that involves reading some books. In other cases, it's just pick one or two courses. So you as a mentor, how, like as you build up this community of people who are striving for sainthood, what are some of the other benefits for somebody to uh, engage with this platform, the science of sainthood, to be able to not only learn more about the faith, learn practical advice, but to be surrounded by people like you who are are uh, pursuing it as one of the most important things, if not the one thing necessary that we must do in our lives. Well, I think you hit on one of the things, Scott, and that is that it, there are, it's a community. We're the family of God, right? Literally. You know, as a Protestant growing up, I would kind of use that kind of terminology, like, you know, my brother, you're my sister. As a Catholic, that takes on a completely different meaning because we are literally unified by the sacraments to the mystical body of Jesus Christ. You are my brother, literally. And when you encounter other brothers and sisters who are united to Christ and who really want to grow in the spiritual life and achieve what it is that they were made for, it's like anything else. I mean, they're, they're going to rub off on you and you want to move with them, your brothers and sisters into the faith. And so we have a great community of people in the science of sainthood. We have group studies. So if you want to do this on your own, you can, if you want to do it with an online group, you can do that. In fact, I encourage people to start these SOS groups in their parishes as well. And there are workbooks that go with some of the programs and such, but all of this is designed to take you as a, as a member of the body of Christ, more deeply into relationship with God, but also, to your point, with other people. We're supposed to love God and love neighbor, right? And so this empowers that in a way that you can't get anywhere else because at the end of the day, charity is the goal, right? St. Paul says that, that even if I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Well, everything in the spiritual life is ordered to that love. Love for you, love for God, even love for my enemies. I got want to transform my relationship with them as well. And so doing that with other brothers and sisters in the faith who are as dedicated and, and desire God as much as you do, uh, there's nothing like that. I mean, this is really what our parishes are supposed to be. Lots of times we know that we don't really have those kind of interactions in parishes. I wish it were different. Some parishes are great. Some are, yeah, you know, whatever. But there are groups of people who desire this deeply, and the Science of Sainted community is certainly one of those places. Well, certainly we know at Catholic Vote, we've created a community of people who want to live our Catholic faith in public and to try to make America as strong as it can be for all of us and for all those who will come after us in, in, in this country. Uh, you, in a very practical way, are helping Catholics to take practical steps, united with other people who are working 
on it, uh, also alongside them uh, to try to become everything that God has wants us to be, and who He's created that opportunity for all of us so that we can be in this life. But it does take some effort, it takes some intentionality, and it takes some coaching and mentorship. Matt, w- Matthew, what's the best way for Edify Podcast listeners to learn more about you and the very various formational offerings you provide? I would say just go to scienceofsainthood.com. And uh, I, I would just say this with regard to Catholic vote and edify and, and things that you guys are doing, all vitally important stuff. And there's a, a degree to which we need to be engaged in the world. And this is what you guys are helping us to do, to engage the, the world and to help change not just politics, but life in general, so that it's a more Christian Catholic life, which we are all made for. In order to really take the active life and make it what it's supposed to be, it has to be formed on the contemplative life. We talk about active contemplatives in the world. It really should be reversed. Contemplative actives. All the actions and things that we do have to be founded on that relationship with God. So we, the things that, you, that we are working on, Brother Scott, <laughs> are just hand in glove. This is what it's all about as we transform the world for Jesus Christ. So uh, scienceofsainthood.com is where, uh, where you go to, to discover more about what I'm doing. So as you've just said, the Catholic faith is one where it's more both and than either yes. or. It's both science and art. It's both contemplative and active. And you'll learn a lot of practical tools, not only here at Edify, but also at the scienceofsainthood.com. So thank you, Matthew, uh, for joining us today and for helping edify Catholics so that together we can edify America. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for listening. To make it easy for you to listen to future Edify podcast episodes, please make sure you subscribe over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you.